Well, my friends, I know we've all seen the news of Biden, uh, you know, saying that he's not going to be running for president. Why then would he continue to act as president? That's a separate question, which we'll probably also address here. But in addition, we have the Vatican coming out with a very bizarre thing on Vatican News, comparing Biden's resignation to that of Benedict the 16th. And if that isn't weird enough, we've actually got the answer. Very first time, a candid response from Elon Musk um, as to why he sort of all of a sudden started fighting the woke thing is really stunning. And he's very candid. You know, stay tuned to this episode of Faith and Reason. Father Charles Murray, Frank Wright, so good to be with you as always. Hello again. Great being with you. Thank you. Father, if you could lead us off with a prayer, please. Certainly. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater nostre, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomin tuum adveniat, regnum tuum fiat voluntas tua, sicur in celo et in terra. Panem nostrum, iano, da nobis omni, et imite nobis, de vita nostra, sicur et nos divitemus, e vitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducast, in tentationem, sed liberanos a mano. Amen. Sed sapiensie ora pro nobis, virgo prudens ora pro nobis. Auni patris et filii et spiritus sanctus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... Very first thing we saw um, as last week unfolded, of course, was the uh, Biden saying that he was no longer going to run for uh, president for election in 2024. Uh, it's just upcoming to the this was, I guess, somewhat expected, but it took so long. What was the delay? We don't know. But before we even get there, I just wanted to address the Vatican. There was a Vatican news release that happened just after as they were presenting the news and they compared it to the resignation of Benedict XVI, which I think is kind of outrageous. But here's what they did. Um, the deputy director of the Holy See's in-house news organization praised the U.S. Uh, President Joe Biden for withdrawing from the 2024 election race as a noble choice. Uh, comparing it to the resignation in 2013 of Pope Benedict XVI. This is what he said. No, it was entitled Knowing When to Step Down. The commentary was penned by Alessandro Gisotti, who, is, as I mentioned, is the deputy editorial director of Vatican Media. And he commented that stepping back as has a cost, he said. Um, and uh, he compared it to a South African... Uh, President Nelson Mandela's 1999 decision not to seek re-election, also to the sudden resignation of Benedict XVI. Whenever a prominent, and this is a quote, whenever a prominent public figure chooses to step back to take a leave of absence, he or she immediately captures public sympathy and esteem. We are experienced in this in this in a striking way on February 11, 2013, with Benedict the 16th historic res renunciation of the Petron ministry. We grasp it, albeit in a different sphere just as evidently in these last 24 hours after U.S. President Joe Biden announced that he will give up his run for a second term in the White House, leaving it to his party to choose a new candidate. I'm sorry, uh, and Father, maybe I can have your take on this. To make any, any comparison from Benedict XVI to Biden is to me so gross, so... It, it is crazy. It's... It's stunningly awful. Um, love to hear your take on it. Well, especially when they're mentioning, too, in the same breath, uh, that uh, public esteem goes up for those who uh, reside or, or get out of the limelight. Uh, public esteem, as far as I can recall, for, for Pope Benedict uh, resigning didn't go up. It went down because we were, we were, we were missing him before he even left. As a, as, as a matter of fact, I remember how stunned the world was, the Catholic world uh, at, at that time, and the secular world too. It was just a, it was an odd thing that a pope would resign, but it didn't come as as a as a joyful thing uh, uh, of of stepping down and the world would be a better place. And thank you for your contribution. Uh, no, it wasn't that. 
Uh, I wonder if I wonder if they they're not hinting at somebody else's resignation in the not too far distance. Who knows? But I, I didn't. Uh, I just thought it was. I thought it was a very kind of a strange sounding thing uh, to compare one thing with the other. Well, I think it's it's quite insulting, really, to compare one Catholic to one who, well, frankly, supports abortion and does very little to deserve the name. Um, in a just world, I expect that a former President Biden, as we may soon refer to him, uh, should be excommunicated for his crimes against the church. But if you do want to draw some kind of parallels, perhaps um, the suggestion of the power of a um, allegedly homosexual mafia behind this might be one that would be justifiable in saying that this is the reason why, uh, you know, Biden's departure is comparable to that Benedict. It was Biden himself who suggested that Obama was a homosexualist in around 2013 or 2012, perhaps, when uh, he insinuated that when uh, he talked about people having to get tested for AIDS. Um, Obama was quick to point out that he had been uh, accompanied by Michelle when he did get tested. But nonetheless, uh, there is that element. And uh, secondary, of course, is the obvious controversy around Biden's supposed withdrawal. Supposed withdrawal. But many people have said that that wasn't even his signature on the paper. And it appears that the letter itself wasn't written by him, but by a man called Steve Lachetti. Uh, the news being tweeted out, of course, by an Ipta, who is a young woman. Um, Biden appears to have had absolutely no part in this process. And when he was confronted by, I think, CNN, yesterday about the fact he appeared to be completely unaware of it. It's a strange business altogether, and, and one that, that that simply invites your incredulity to say that it ennobles President Biden. It raises far more questions than it answers, to be frank. I don't know how the news was in the United States or across the world, but here in, in Spain, about this morning, the first thing I heard uh, 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 was that uh, Biden had suffered a stroke. There are rumors that he was dead. This is what we've come to now. Now that the mainstream media and the narrative is is questioned so much, there was a lot of rumor that that he was dead uh, until he was spotted uh, coming on a plane again. The lack of trust in the mainstream is now so extreme that people don't know, honestly don't know what to believe anymore. Media leaks claim that Biden's initial disappearance was explained not by COVID, which was apparently a cover story, but by unconfirmed reports that he'd fallen and hit his head, resulting in a, a near medical emergency. And there is some uh, evidence to suggest that that's the case. The idea that the, the plane was moving so fast, the transport was really shaking and so on. So the whole business is, is suspicious, to say the least. But the, the method of his withdrawal, the fact that his own campaign team said they read about his decision to stand down on Twitter, uh, is also remarkable too. It seemed to have come as a surprise not just to President Biden himself, but to his entire inner circle. So to, to ennoble him for this seems bizarre. I'm remembering uh, uh, Dorothy Parker, who was seen at the Algonquin uh, at the round table. And they came in with the news, a waiter came in with the news that Calvin Coolidge had died. And she just looked up and said, how can they tell Anyway, go ahead. On the general news itself of of Biden's resignation um, and and Kamala's being endorsed by almost everybody, markedly not the Obamas, but by almost everybody. We had a conversation with this uh, in a staff call when it happened. I thought one of our team made a very interesting point. Uh, You can't even say if, if you didn't know better, but you just say, I wonder if they're not trying to make America look completely ridiculous. First of all, they've got Biden in who, yeah, he's an 80 year old, 80, 81 year old plus, and he's just not there. You could tell he wasn't there. And he was doing for a man of his age, remarkable stuff, but he's a typical man of his age and not like a, someone totally gifted. And he was having a hard time. And it was pretty plain to almost the whole planet that he wasn't really, I mean, if this is America, this is pretty pathetic. And then when you look to Kamala, because you could pretty well ignore her because airhead is a name that comes to mind that seems 
because her statements are so bizarre and so lacking in intelligibility. And it's, you feel for her as you feel for Biden, but to seriously consider her as someone who would rule the country, they, there's a lot better options. Even if you went for someone in America who was on the other side, who was on the side of evil, there's a lot better spokesmen and women. Um, one of the suggestions that would, was made a long time ago, what about if Oprah Winfrey ran? That would be really scary because she's super popular. She's also able to string a few words together and make some sense. She appeals to people and stuff like that. Why? Why are they running these folks who are just so out there, so seemingly better? Are they trying to make America a laughingstock? One of the issues that you have to confront uh, if you look at Biden's cognitive decline is that, I mean, Carlson, Tucker Carlson points out that he indicated, along with many others, as early as 2019, that Biden was undergoing a visible cognitive decline even five years ago. So before he was elected, if we believe he was elected, uh, he was he was showing signs of cognitive decline that were obvious. Now, this suggests, at the very least, that he's never been running the country. And if so, the real question is who runs America? Because if you're going to put someone up as, as frankly, ridiculous as uh, as, as Kamala Harris, that you you beg the question: this must be intentional to permit people behind the scenes to operate in levers of power. And now most people think that that's a banner. If that's the case, then surely it's, it's incomprehensible that these people actually do run it. And it would appear to be the case that they don't. And uh, that's a transition to a form of kind of public government that has never been announced and is, is, is yet another indication of the bankruptcy, the moral and legitimacy bankruptcy of the, of the American system generally. So, you know, how long has he been in decline? At least five years. And it's clear at this point that he probably hasn't had much in the way of influence, despite being in name, the most powerful man on earth. And these are strange times indeed. But it, it, it forces the conclusion that the President of the United States is simply a figurehead for, for people behind him or her. And this is the reason why candidates are selected for their incompetence. Incompetence generally is, is more of a, of a career of success, a guarantee of success in your career rather, than being good at anything nowadays. And as, as being President has shown us, you can rise to the very top if you're completely useless. Yeah, the, the idea that the incompetence uh, uh, aids you rise to the top. But th this is a darker thing than that. This is the, that it's helpful to people who wish to remain behind the scenes to have some clownish figurehead uh, who's nominally in charge. Wait, you but can that's, take the that's my issue with it, though, because they could have made it seem better, still have a puppet, but a puppet who speaks well, a puppet who is willing to literally sell it without making it so grossly obvious that so that was my my only point was are they trying to send a message that america is like a totally loser country because it's working if they are if not i'm sure you could have paid a lot of people who could speak more intelligibly than kamala harris and joe biden to take your cause forward and be obedient to everything you want to say. John Henry, you have, you have a problem there because you not only need, you need, you not only need someone uh, behind the scenes who can talk through these people and communicate through them, but you need to have people, the puppets themselves, have to be so desperate to be in those positions that they would do anything to remain there. See, the problem is if, if you have somebody who's capable, who's, who's, a, who's, a, who's an intelligent being, they would want to break away as soon as possible and become their own president. So you've got to have, you've got to have people that you can depend on. And Joe Biden was certainly dependable in that sense. There was, there was also this morning on the news a take from the, from the, uh, was it the Democratic uh, debate, not the debate, but when they were all trying buying for candidates, candidacy. And, and Kamala said to, uh, to, to Joe uh, Biden, uh, she said, you know, remember the Wizard of Oz. Of course, this will be her speed. Remember the Wizard of Oz. But the wizard was such a magnificent and scary thing. And then she looked at Joe and she said, but when they pulled back the curtain, he was a little man, a very little man. And that, of course, that was, that was pointed. 
the, the thing is, that I don't think that many people doubt that it has been Obama running, uh, running his, having his third term. But he picked the right kind of people because it's you can't have a thinker. You can't have somebody who's going to be independent. It doesn't work that way. Uh, it, 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 it never worked in, in politics. Uh, I, mean, I mean, recall to uh, uh, Jimmy Hoffa with the uh, the, the Teamsters. Uh, he wanted to summon, He wanted uh, someone. What was his name? Fitz Fitzgerald, I think. Fitzgerald Fitzgibbons, whatever it was. He had wanted somebody to hold his place while he was in prison, and uh, uh, the man that he decided was not too not too bright and would hold his place. Place did not hold his place. He became the real president and had, wanted nothing to do with with uh, Jimmy Hoffa at all. So you you've got to keep you've got to have people that are willing to play the game. And with those two, with Kamala and with uh, Biden, he had the perfect. Uh, I think Obama had the perfect people in, in, in place to be able to to go through this. None of them would break away. What do you think the game plan is? Because. Um... With all these endorsements, notably the Obamas have not yet endorsed. Any thoughts there, Father, on what might be going on or or um, what we might be seeing in the next couple of months? Nothing. And let me repeat that. Nothing would surprise me. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. However, I think what 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 they're going to do, I don't know. I, I don't want to I don't want to get anybody in trouble and certainly not this program, but the the they built such a thing around racism and uh, and sexism that that's their entire platform for running. It's it's not based on anything with that to do with merit or anything. So I think they're going to show Kamala or the Democrats will put in somebody uh, again reliable to play the game, and uh, they will hit hard on abortion rights. That will be the strongest play. What a woman's uh, right to uh, to choose, and this and the other thing. Those are going to be the issues. They they can't speak about about the last four years, or about the last three and a half years, because it's been disastrous uh, financially uh, uh, and what have you going on with the country. Uh, they're going. <laughs> we certainly live in interesting times. That's all I'm, I'm saying. But it's very dangerous to have people who are so incompetent lending themselves to be used as puppets. It's very, it's very dangerous because they often say stupid things and get, and get us in trouble internationally and nationally. Well, I heard from Neil Oliver, a British uh, COVID skeptic and general regime critic, a, a wonderful phrase, ultra bonkers. And I think that's what we can expect. So far, 2024 has been satisfyingly bonkers, if you're a fan of bonkers, and I think you can expect more of the same. Would be extremely bonkers, and completely insane. Uh, and in, in something in that line, I've already seen suggested that Hillary Clinton it would make a very good vice presidential pick for Kamala Harris, probably to repeat the process that we've just seen this week and see Hillary slid in for the presidency. But I think the the most obvious thing that's happening there uh, is something that obviously that Elon Musk himself said yesterday in a rather terse little tweet. He said, we, we have heard uh, that Joe Biden was perfectly capable until the moment it was accepted that he had to step down. And now we're going to hear how wonderful Kamala Harris is. Now, I think what we're going to see is, and I think we've already started to see this, actually, I saw reports today, that polls suggest that Kamala can win. I think we're going to hear a lot of stories about how wonderful she is. We're going to see things like her cooking and playing with children and so on, and see what a great person she is. She's going to be heavily marketed as a credible candidate. And that obviously gainsays everything that we know, because stating the obvious is anathema to this media regime. We're going to hear about how wonderful Kamala Harris is, and we're going to be shown polls that show her climbing in the polls. Uh, personally, I think that they know that the election is lost, and I think that the idea now is to try and save the Senate and, uh, and the Congress really from, from a total loss. Yeah, I mean, it's already starting. Obviously, uh, she's getting better writing. Uh, just seeing her addresses after her endorsements, uh, already there's an uptick in her making sense, saying witty things that are actually witty. Um, so that that's already there. Some of that is being done for her, you know, teleprompter. She can read, which which is good. Um, that's actually, she has one up on Joe there. It is remarkable, though. Kamala Harris has refused to meet with Benjamin Netanyahu. 
she not only refused to meet him off the plane, he's supposed to speak to the US Congress on the 27th of July, and he arrived the day before yesterday, and she declined to meet him. And this has been described as a scandal. And not only that, but she's also since all her handlers have announced that she won't be seeing him at Congress or at any time, it seems. And she's been denounced for this, saying that it's a terrible snow. And this is being used by pro-Israeli um, politicians, mainly in the Republican style, to, to denigrate her. Now, this is a remarkable departure from form, of course. And one would have expected that Joe Biden would have met with Netanyahu, who would indeed have gone to hear him at Congress. Now, this is, a re- this is a departure from form. This does show a, a change in step, whether it's Harris herself or the people behind her. But this, this is an interesting and remarkable development, given that we would have expected her to, to toe the line, as it were, of, um, of decades of, of U.S. foreign policy and its deference to the Israel lobby, uh, and certainly in the person of Benjamin Netanyahu, who appears to have been directing U.S. affairs uh, to his will. In, in Israel so far. So I think that's remarkable. I, I also remember that, first of all, I, I think that, that if Netanyahu wanted to meet with, with the Joe Biden, he could meet with Joe Biden. There would be no problem because Joe Biden the next day would know that he had met with Netanyahu. I, I, that's simple. But also, if you recall, uh, there was sort of a, a, a Francis Cardinal Kim moment with Netanyahu years ago with with Obama. Obama had him waiting, I don't know, an hour, but two hours sitting on a chair outside of his office rather than keeping the appointment. Do you, do you remember that? And he didn't receive him. They had, they had a meeting. And of course, Obama doesn't uh, doesn't like the, the whole Israel thing at all. He doesn't approve that, which would be the reason that Kamala doesn't like it either. And she's playing along with it. But but he had he had... He had the, the Prime Minister of Israel waiting, waiting for him while he, I don't know what he was doing, but uh, it was an absolute, it was, it was serious. It was a serious uh, insult. Well, it, it's a critical moment because he's expect, Netanyahu is expected to appeal to the United States Congress for basically for support in any false coming war against Iraq, which is likely to be triggered if he proceeds with his largely, um, well, with his intentions to invade Lebanon, which he hasn't disavowed which would trigger Iran's involvement and therefore necessitate U.S. direct support in the war, because otherwise Israel would be annihilated. So it is curious and indeed very important that, that Harris refuses to meet with him. Uh, and it remains to be seen what he says to Congress on the 27th of July, but it, um, in his appearances in the past with the U.S. Congress, they had usually ended up with the United States involved in a war in the Middle East, as that was the case in 2002. One of the other fascinating aspects about last week was this interview that Elon Musk gave to Jordan Peterson. If the viewers out there wouldn't mind joining us, we should really pray for the conversion of Elon Musk. Uh, we do it LifeSite every day, by the way. Uh, but it's it's really important, especially as he now gets a taste. One of the one of the other statements he made there was, "You ever wonder why he talks about population? It's actually linked to Christianity as well." Listen to this. He said, as we heard just now. I think there's an argument that when a culture loses its religion, it starts to become anti-natalist, decline in numbers, and potentially disappear. So his going on, as we've seen over the last, actually over a year now, talks about and tweets about, um, you know, worrying about population decline are also related uh, to this thing. And I wish someone would introduce him to a more traditional Catholicism because that uh, espoused right now by Pope Francis is is not the Catholicism that uh, you know that that we're used to or that is follows from Jesus Christ. It's it's something else altogether uh, that that flows more from from uh, you know Father James Martin. So, but Musk's remarks are almost a verbatim uh, assessment, a summary. They're almost a verbatim summary of Cardinal Robert Sarah's remarks on the same issue in 2019, for which he was fined several thousand euros for hate speech, saying that Europe and the West was appeared to be committing suicide through its antinatalism and through, and he said it was surrendering its culture and compared the West in a speech in French to a tree that had cut off its roots that was going to die. I think Elon Musk's been radicalized by reality. The reality he's been radicalized by is the visible face of evil. The face of evil that he perceives in, in his status as one of the most powerful men in the world, as he comes face to face with others, 
but also the face of evil that has touched his own family. And when you become face to face with evil, evil is a living principle. It is difficult to argue against the existence of God. And I think that this is the reality that's radicalizing him, and it, he won't be the last. I think many people are beginning to realize that if there is such a clear and present agenda of evil, an active evil in the world, then there must be its antithesis. There must be a God, and it is time to choose a side. This is a time in which people are picking their side. They are being radicalized by reality. Reality is a theocracy. You do have to acknowledge the existence of God. You realize your foolishness in failing to have done so beforehand, and what you may fall victim to if you do what, because the evidence is now increasingly difficult to ignore, and that evidence is evil, and it's in our political establishment, and it's corrupting our every institution, sadly indeed uh, also the church. It's a perfect segue, Frank, into our next topic, and that is the sad case of America's next Terry Schiavo. It is a young woman by the name of Margot Naranjo, um, whose parents, I mean, she was in a car accident years ago, um, you know, very healthy, vibrant young person in a car accident that left her uh, very severely disabled. So uh, while she breathes on her own, she has to have help with both artificial nutrition and hydration. Um, this has gone on with her for years now. And the parents just announced last week that the doctors had encouraged them to withdraw nutrition and hydration. And that, you know, within four or five days, particularly with the withdrawal of hydration, she would go and get this, like to be with Jesus. That is sad for all sorts of reasons. But it's even sadder still to learn that these parents are Catholics. And they've been praying about this situation and have been so misled by also those within the church. They've got her funeral booked. They've got her celebration of life booked the next day based on the fact that they are purposefully withdrawing nutrition hydration so that she dies. They're explaining it in terms of, oh, she can go be with Jesus. But what a horrific thing. If you think about what that is, because we saw it with Terry Schiavo. We saw what happens when you withdraw nutrition and hydration. As Bobby Schindler explained, um, as he did many, in many, many talks and, and videos that he's given, they look like concentration camp victims being starved to death. And remember, in Schindler's case, they refused even to put some ice on her lips because she was, they could tell, the parents could tell, her brother could tell, she was starving to death. And as she was, her lips were dry and she was literally being dehydrated to death and they could do nothing under, under pain of, of being hauled away by, by security and by police. They had to watch their daughter, their sister be starved to death. And yet this is what's being told of this family, that this is the way to go. Medically, it's, oh, it's good. It's what you, and then spiritually as well. So it is real evil. And yeah, these are really hard situations, Father, I know that. Um, and uh, I just love your take on it because it is so tragic what's going on. What upsets me more, and I think it upsets an awful lot of Catholics, is, again, we're back into the same thing of ambiguity. As Where is this happening with, with the, with the, uh, the Miss Naranjo? Where, where is it? It's in Texas. The, the girl's in Texas. In Texas. Does she have? Does she live in a diocese? Does it have a bishop? Has the bishop spoken? I mean, this is incredible. That's that's why we have bishops. That's why we have priests. We have it's to educate people. And this is a this is a, a, a an outstanding moment, a sad moment, but an outstanding one that should be taken advantage to not only save her life, but also teach Catholic ethics, especially to Catholics, but also to also an unbelieving world. We, the, nobody knows what we believe in because nobody speaks up for it. If they have a bishop and that bishop has not spoken shame on it. Unfortunately, Father, I have the answer for you. At least the answer has been silence. And it's worse than that even because this is Texas. And if you remember a certain bishop from Texas uh, who was ousted, uh, Bishop Joseph Strickland was ousted but one of the ways that he 
angered his brother bishops was intervening exactly on a case like this. Years ago, there was a case of a little baby born to a single mom of African-American heritage, so a black mom with a black baby, and the baby was born with this a disorder whereby she needed artificial nutrition and hydration. And the mom was pleading for her life, and the doctors were, nope, we're going to withdraw nutrition hydration. It was so sad, and nobody spoke out except for Bishop Joseph Strickland, who intervened. They had another hospital willing to take the baby. They had donations to help the baby. And yet the doctors at that hospital were not willing to let him go until there was intervention. But the bishops were not happy with Bishop Joseph Strickland going against them and fighting for this baby. That baby's alive today because of Bishop Strickland. The mom is taking care of her, sure, and she's still disabled, sure. But the point is, it's a life. And according to the mom, it's a loved life. And yet, the bishops were silent and angry with their brother bishop for having intervened. The bishop of that diocese should still feel ashamed of himself for not having the cojones to, to speak up and, and say what is right. You, you know, if this is this is the ceremony of, 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 of creating a bishop is, is a beautiful ceremony. I'm not so familiar with the Novus Ordo one, but I remember the, 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 the Ventus Ordo was the gospel was placed upon the back of the kneeling bishop in front of the bishop who was going to consecrate it. The gospel was open, and the weight of the gospel was put on the ordinandi's back. And he had to swear an oath, almost a banal oath. It comes from exactly what Christ demanded of his disciples and his apostles, the first bishops. When it is yes, say yes. When it is no, say no. Do you promise to do this? And they all say yes. And they all, almost all of them, do not do that. That's a very simple order given to a bishop. And if he doesn't follow that, I don't know why in the world he accepted becoming a bishop to be why. If anybody's interested in that old case, go look it up. It's Tinsley Lewis is the, is the child's name. Uh, but Frank, love to hear your take tragic case of Margot Naranjo. Uh, right now, by the way, they, they do have a restraining order. There has been some intervention based on a lot of uh, people speaking out. Uh, LifeSite covered it. We we're one of the first to cover it. And praise God, that got spread around and had some real effect. And uh, so right now there was a restraining order. So we'll see what happens. But this is an ongoing case and need both of your prayers and action if you're able to. Margot Naranjo. Frank, your take. Well, either life has an essential value, as the Catholic Church teaches, or it doesn't. If it doesn't have an essential value, it has a liberal value, which is made out of words, and those definitions can change. And it's always described in nice-sounding words, like, you know, the limitation of suffering, or a healthcare option, or, you know, a quiet and, and assisted death. Some euphemism is usually employed. It is simply not Catholic to replace the essential value of life with the attributed value of life based upon convenience, ultimately, and cost and utility, which is the measure of morality in a post-Christian dystopia that we inhabit here. In a similar sense, language is manipulated here, and it means that not only is the value of life replaced by a few definitions that are convenient, but the means of ending it as well is deliberately obscured. Now, withdrawing essential life-supporting treatment does not result in a quiet and painless death. When people are deprived of food, your liver begins to metabolize itself in an extremely painful process. The byproducts of this place excessive strain upon the kidneys, which themselves, having no water, result in failure. And this is an extremely painful way to die. You die of mainly liver and kidney failure arising from the deprivation of food and water from your system. It's agonizing. It paralyzes people in agony, actually. It makes them incapable of speech, even if they were capable of it. It is an horrific death to wish upon anyone. And simply no one is frank about that either. There is no sincerity about the means of the delivery of death, nor about the imperative to do so. 
people are disposed of because they are simply inconvenient. This, this abrogates the basic principle of life that is at the center of the, the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and it has an essential value not given by man, but attributed by God because we belong to him. We, we are not simply the property of our parents or of the people that care for us, as it were, in our healthcare institutions. It, it, it reduces life to a valueless transaction to be determined by a simple cost-benefit analysis. To move immediately to making preparations for a celebration of life afterwards seems beyond callous. It's, uh, it's, it's gruesome to contemplate. One of the things that will come up with this story and what I asked Bishop Strickland about yesterday when I spoke to him about it, which I encourage you to go watch that show with Bishop Strickland. It's a special about uh, Margot Naranjo and her case. Um, and he brings up the Tinsley Lewis uh, case from years ago. One of the things I asked him about, because it's on everybody's mind, you know, what about these these people who are so severely disabled, they, they can't really move? And, uh, you know, the parents, it's very difficult to take care of them. And, you know, it's a life of just having to take care of somebody. And isn't that horrible? And can't we just, quote unquote, let them die? Remember, though, we're not talking about, um, you know, if you were feeding somebody and giving them water, they still die. You can never give them food and water so and, and, and avert the dying process anyway. No, death still happens. So it's just providing the basic necessities that the church insists upon. But um, Father, what is the take? And I asked Bishop Strickland this too, but I'd love to hear your take. You know, what is the the answer, if you will, to this uh, life like that kind of suffering where, where you're, uh, people say a vegetable would not really be vegetable because they're moving, but it's like, you know, none of the utilitarian things that, that a person is good for uh, you know, so they can't speak and they can't uh, they can't go to the bathroom themselves. They need all that care. And even as adults, they need that care. Is it cruel to to let them live? Isn't it better to put them out of their misery? I think the answer was given by our Lord himself. When the question was brought to him, point blank, this man was born blind. Why was he born blind? Was it his sin? the sin of his fathers, or further back, generational. Whose sin is this man paying? You remember that question put to Christ, the blind man. And our Lord's answer was, not for any of those reasons. He's not paying for his sin. He's not paying for his father's sin or his grandfather's sin. He was born blind. Listen to the answer. So that the glory of God could be manifested. Now that sounds like a crazy, crazy answer. But now let me give you another story that followed up. And I connected these in, in, in real time, in lifetime. Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, I was passing through Shreveport and I stayed at a, at a uh, with some good sisters that I have working with me in Mexico. They have a, 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 a convent and a, an institute there for severely, for uh, when uh, children with Down syndrome and severely, uh, severely brain damaged children. And one of the, the nuns took me through the, the cradle room, the, all of these small children, infants. We came to one cradle and I looked at this child. The child had a head that was about a foot and a half long, a tiny body, tiny legs, arms, and the eyes were just going every which way. And without thinking, without thinking what I was saying, I just looked down, and you know those times when you're thinking something and you actually speak it, but you, you didn't do it intentionally? The words came out. And looking down at this child, his name was Jeffrey. I'll never forget it. And I said out loud, not me too, why would God permit such a thing? As soon as I said it, I realized I said it and I was repentant already. The nun who was with me, who was the caregiver for all of these children, who were about eight, I think, if I remember correctly. Right. She said, in this, the most beautiful and simple terms, she said, 
so that I could become a saint. I mean, that, that killed me. That killed me. So that I could become a saint, that's why he did this. Why was this man born blind? So that the glory of God could be made known. How, how is that glory made known? He's being taken care of by people who can see. Why are there poor people so that rich people can help them? Why are there people who are not so intelligent so that the intelligent can help them? Give a hand, a hand. Uh-oh. Why are, are there problems in the world so that they be solved? That's why they exist. You know, you, wow. this is it. You don't just say, oh, uh, uh, let him die. That's the solution. Now, these are all hurdles in life. Everybody has had them. Everybody has been challenged in their life. And if you haven't, get ready. Get ready because it's going to happen. And you have to jump that hurdle. You have to accept that. You have to find the solution. You might have to be a little bit less selfish. There are solutions. Life is precious. God knows what God does. All right? Uh, we are the solutions. We are supposed to be finding solutions, not letting people die, not killing babies. Not, this, is not, this is not human. This is not even human. Uh, why was this man born blind? For the, so that the glory of God be manifest. Why did God permit Jeffrey to be born? <laughs> Listen to the little nun next to me, so that I could become a saint. Another thing that happened last week was um, a really a, a beautiful thing. Um, we had the Eucharistic revival in Indiana. This was the culmination of the sort of year-long effort of the bishops to reignite some faith in the Eucharist. It was uh, interesting because they did pilgrimage from all over the country to uh, to Indiana, uh, met up there. This is the culminating week, a uh, week-long event. LifeSite was there as official media. Um, we worked with a group uh, called uh, Corpus Christi for Unity and Peace, a lovely lady by the name of Vicki Yamasaki. Um, and... Uh, Vicky is native to Indiana, and she learned early on in this thing as we were, uh, you know, thought about it. She tried to find a Latin mass because there's lots of people who, for whom a Latin mass is essential, and they wanted two to participate in this Eucharistic revival, uh, based on the fact that the Pew poll came out uh, a few years ago and said they're basically the lack of belief in the Eucharist among Catholics is le- legion. In fact, it's it's uh, upwards of. Uh, over 80, almost 90% don't believe. Um, and so it was to address that. Learning that there was no Latin masses, uh, one of the uh, one of our generous donors uh, asked us to afford a, a Latin mass so that people could uh, have a Latin mass. And um, also there was a lot of people who wanted to participate and it was too expensive to uh, participate. And so we thought, well, we could do that. We could have a free event, free lunch, Latin Mass, and uh, we could probably have some great speakers. And so we did that. So in the midst of the uh, Eucharistic Congress uh, that they had, we held a free event uh, right next door. at the. It was actually at a baseball stadium. Um, and um, it was beautiful. It was, uh, we had 750 uh, free lunches uh, available for people. Uh, actually, we got 50 extra, but the 750 all went. So, uh, and then and then I think they, they handed out some more. So, it was really beautiful. We had more people than we expected because we were. I was first expecting maybe a couple hundred would come, but uh, so a lot of people. We had a beautiful procession around the baseball stadium. We actually intended to go around the Congress itself, but there was some uh, difficulties uh, with doing that. So we volunteered to to do it inside the stadium. It was beautiful. Father Jeff Fashing led the Eucharistic procession. Uh, Father James Altman said the uh, said the mass. Um, and they both gave talks. I gave a little talk there myself. And then we had this uh, beautiful talk by uh, Archbishop Vigano, which was stunning because it's his first public address uh, since the Vatican said that he was automatically excommunicated. Uh, and of course, that that creates also uh, its own its own thing. But uh, it was it was really beautiful. There was so many people touched by it. So many people grateful for it. And one of the neat things was that after we announced publicly that we were having this event, um, the Eucharistic Congress itself was then allowing for Latin masses as well. It was in a further away location, a very small location, unfortunately, but but, uh, I went to that mass as well, 
and uh, that one celebrated by Archbishop Corleone. And they had, I made it in, with, and I was there over half an hour early, and I think I was just about the last, maybe within the last five people who were allowed in the church. There's 500 plus inside, and then they have an overflow uh, under a tent outside. It was over 500 again. So it was uh, hugely attended. Obviously, uh, they were expect there were there was many more than expected, but um, again, that was far away. Uh, we did walk, but it took a long time. It was fine, but um, it was an amazing event overall. It was uh, very interesting, though the 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 bit of a mixed bag because, of course, you had Cardinal Supic there saying a mass. You had Cardinal Gregory there saying a mass, and uh, one of the things I spoke of, at least in in my little talk at our. Uh, traditional, we called it the traditional Eucharistic revival, was that one of the causes for the lack of belief of Jesus' true presence in the Eucharist is that the bishops and, and many priests failed to observe Canon 915, failed to reserve the Blessed Sacrament for those who are properly disposed, uh, and particularly uh, won't give communion to public obstinate sinners like pro-abortion politicians. Um, so, I think that all plays in, but it was uh, really beautiful, as you saw there. The clips while I was speaking, the, you know, some of the B-roll, if you will, of uh, what happened—a really joyous event, and one which I think did add to the Eucharistic Congress in a positive way. We tried everything we could to make it a side event to augment and to help with the Eucharistic revival, which we were very much encouraging uh, from, from the bishops. And uh, we've got great footage there, great uh, interviews, uh, and so on that's going to be rolling out over the next uh, few days. We have a procession here, a pilgrimage, uh, as they, you have the, the, the Chartres uh, pilgrimage in France. There is, a, there is a place of pilgrimage here in Spain called Covadonga. And this year, I mean, thousands of people go there. Thousands of people go there. And this year, thousands of young people. It's, it's phenomenal. You can find it on YouTube or wherever. Uh, this year, they are forbidden to have the Latin Mass inside the church. So uh, thousands of young, children, young, young people, mostly teenagers, uh, are going to have the Latin Mass outside, outside the church. You just hope that it doesn't rain, but they can't go into the church and have the Latin Mass. That, that, you know, there's. I'm going to tell you something. The funny part about this whole thing, the humorous part, I think, it, from God's point of view, the Latin Mass is going to win. That that's the future, or or a, 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 it's going to be part of the of the of a, of a mass that's that's put together well this time to be the part of the future. But I thought, of all of the crazy things that I've heard, thousands of young people have to stay outside and kneel on the ground, we hope it doesn't rain, uh, rather than be able to go into a Catholic church and, and hear a mass. It's amazing. But the, the fight the fight continues, the fight continues. And it's a good fight, it's a good fight. All of those, all of those young people are so enthusiastic, so knowledgeable, and so strong in their faith, it's wonderful. And the thing of the, of the Eucharistic, the Eucharist, uh, Conference, Eucharistic Conference. I, I think I heard that it cost something like fifty million dollars. I could have saved everybody that that cost. There's there's some simple things that you do. You get you reinstate kneelers. You take away communion in the hand, and you it re it reinstate the the fasting rules, like three hours before, and you give some solemnity. To the Eucharist, uh, you you also put the tabernacle back where it belongs. It belongs in the center of the church. When I was building the the, the chapel in Mexico, our our bishop came out, came out, and he said, "Where are you putting the Where are you putting the tabernacle?" I said, "The Blessed Sacrament is going right there at the center, behind the altar." He said, "Oh, it shouldn't be there." I said, "Where should it be?" He said, "Well, here on one of these side altars. I think it was to Saint Joseph or the Madonna." I said, no, 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 no. Here, here, here's the deal. A tabernacle contains is either Jesus Christ or it is not. If it is not, I don't even want it in the church. I have no time for it. Get rid of it. But if it is, how would I dare put it in any other place but in the very center of, of the church? I, how, 
Can you imagine Christ coming, Christ physically coming down in, in person and you would say to him, go sit over there. <laughs> what? Are, you, are you kidding me? It's, and they don't understand why there's a problem. Amazing. The people who have the Latin mass are overwhelm, overwhelming. They're, they've got to be 100%. If, maybe they'd be 99% that those who believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, maybe 1% doubt. It's exactly the contrary of, of, of the problem that they have with the Novus Ordo. Yet the Novus Ordo has a place for their for their for their activities, and the Latin Mass and the, and the congregants do not. There's the, what times, what tempora awards, what times of custody. I agree with Father that it will be impossible to extinguish the the Mass because uh, and, you know it's the the central ritual of the Catholic faith, and this is what people want from Catholicism. Uh, they want Catholicism. Uh, you know, it's quite simple. We, we live in a broader like, kind of political and religious culture of, of different things being called by the same names. You know, what we, when we talked earlier on about people being radicalized by reality, by coming face to face with the presence of evil and so on, this is going to compel them to turn to God. Uh, and when they want to turn to God, they're going to want to turn to the church, the one true church. And that and the mass is the center of, of the celebration. Of the, of the Catholic faith, uh, and in which most people most frequently participate in it, and that's what they're going to want. It is a, a sad spectacle to see the mass relegated to, um, well, to outside churches. But I don't think this is this is something that's going to continue for much longer. Rather like the liberal global project itself, because the contradictions are so obvious, and yet, and we also live in a time of such urgent spiritual need. It's becoming clearer to people who even aren't religious that there is a spiritual dimension to the crisis in the world. Uh, it's not just an afterthought. It's the same thing. And and that remedy can't be answered by the same kind of ideological counterfeit culture that has caused that crisis and that articulates it. In short, the fakery in the church is the instrument of the enemy as much as it is in politics and in society. And I think that people will be voting with their feet, as it were, but also with their hearts, because they desire the, 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 the consolation of Christ, and they find that in a true mass. Beautiful. You know, the, the organizers of the conference, uh, in, they did do some really neat things to be more reverent. Uh, you will have seen often at World Youth Day masses when there's just massive numbers of people they'll sometimes uh, do strange things for Holy Communion. Um, they'll have armies of, of, of who knows who uh, uh, going to give Holy Communion. They'll have uh, the vessels used will be like cups, sometimes clay and whatever else. This, they did some real care here. So some of the funds, the, I think 28 million or something, went to doing some things properly. So I happened to be at the Cyril Malabar liturgy, which they which they ran there. They ran some of these big masses in Lucas Oil Stadium. So it's a massive stadium. And they filled them because when you have 55,000 people, it's, uh, you, you, it's a lot of people. And so, you know, the procession was, I don't know, looked like 30 bishops, at least hundreds of priests. But the priests were employed to do the distribution of Holy Communion. And all in metal vessels, all in vessels that, you know, gold plated or look like gold vessels um, that they will then be donating to churches. So that was neat. In addition to that, they had a station where about 10 priests or so were cleansing all the vessels after properly cleansing them. So there was some care and concern given. I, that was uh, at least it was much more respectful than than I've often seen at, at some of these big events. So kudos to uh, the organizers who were doing some of that to show some more respect for our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. It was an amalgamation because you did have the likes of Supich and Gregory there. You had, when I was walking down the hallway, I kid you not, there's a, there's a woman who was walking down LGBT something on her shirt, ally. Um, <laughs> so you, you have very much a mixed bag. Uh, but um, to, for, to a large extent, um, 
this was a move to try and bring back belief in our Lord's presence in the Eucharist. Many, many young people, many families. Uh, I urge you to go check out the videos we did from there, um, and there'll be a, a number of them coming out. But uh, I think we'll end it off there because we've run out of time. Uh, Father, last word and blessing, please, uh, for us uh, over to you. My last word is amen. And here goes the blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et fili, spiritus sancti, descendat super os, et maniat sempre. Amen. Amen. Father Charles Murray, Frank Wright, thank you so much. God bless you. And God bless all of you. And we'll see you next time on Faith and Reason.